I want to talk to you this morning about what I call a convoluted journey of life or the random journey of life. And basically the message is be an overcomer. How many want to be an overcomer? <clears throat> Romans 8, 28 to 32 basically tells us that all things work together for good to those who love God. And when he says all things, um, he means everything, all things. So that's the, the right choices you make, that's the wrong choices you make, that get blended and reworked and everything else. That's the sinful choices others make against you that somehow can, he can turn around, he can cause everything to work together for good for those who love him and will trust him to do just that. And so that's kind of the process that, that we're all in. And when we come to Jesus, I think we answer some basic questions as, who am I? Why am I here? Uh, where are we going? What's happening around us? We just need some basic answers to life. And when Jesus comes into your heart, you, you get those basic answers uh, answered basic questions answered, so that you're a special creation of God. He made you for, you know, his, his own pleasure, and you're one of his children, and you have a destiny, and you have a huge future, and so he takes care of your past, your sins get forgiven, and you get washed and cleansed, and, and so you get to go to heaven when you die. How many are looking forward to that? Two or three of you. Okay, heaven is a wonderful place, by the way. And uh, so when the time is right, that's where you want to be. But <clears throat> there's other things in the meantime, in between when your past got taken care of and before you get into your future, it's this thing called doing life together that very often can be confusing because it seldom goes the way that you think it ought to have gone. Have you noticed? How many have noticed that? Okay, so that's what we want to talk about today. And you know, I can remember asking the world, uh, the Lord, uh, God, you want to save the world? Yeah? Why don't we just get on with it? Why is it taking so long. Why all of these wrong turns and hitches and problems arising? Like, why is life so convoluted? Because I, I would have thought, hey, if you really want to save the world, I, I gave him a suggestion one time. I go, Lord, I got a great idea. Why don't we just raise up about a thousand people who are just like Jesus? and anointed like that, and turn them loose on the earth. And, and we could wrap this thing up in, in about 30 days. <laughs> but yet, now I know, he, he has a plan that involves the testing of hearts. Yes. Yes. That's very important to him, and, uh, because, see, we all do pretty good when everything's going our way, Right? But he, he wants to know as well, how do you do when nothing seems to be going your way? Are you still sweet? Are you still loving? Are you still kind? And what we find out is that many of us, um, in our simplistic approach to Christianity, let's, let's, let me put it that way, are unprepared for adversity. Now, adversity is not something you're going to sign up for. And adversity is something that, to a point, you can avoid by making right, godly choices. But then when you've kind of done your bit, life still has a way of testing you to see, you know, just what kind of uh, character is in there, what kind of giftedness and 
competency is in there, what kind of a motive is in the heart, and then what the long-term track record is going to look like. How many are up for this? This is one of the main reasons why we, we need Christian community, why we need church. You know, there's a bunch of people out there saying, ah, oh, you don't need church, away with church. There's just me and God. I watch TV and I get fed here and there. And, but, you know, it's, it's, it's an isolationist approach where I think it's you're afraid to get hurt again because you got hurt in church. Anybody here get hurt in church besides me? And so, but that's family, isn't it? How many grew up in a family that was more than three? Did you ever get hurt in that family? <clears throat> but you overcome that and you press through and uh, you learn to love imperfect people as they're on life's journey towards perfection, hopefully. <clears throat> but there is a popular belief that goes like this. Hey, if I can just get my Christianity just right, I'll have no problems. Uh, if I pray enough, study the word enough, give enough, share enough, serve enough, attend church enough, be good enough, renew my mind enough, love enough, I won't have any problems. And then when something crops up, you think, oh God, what have I done wrong? It must be my fault somehow. But see, we need to realize he has other aspects of his plan, and that includes testing. And so I want to lift the confusion off you today and realize it's just part of life. Um, Psalm 34, 19. Here's a good one for your fridge. Print it out. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. That's the good news, you know. You can just wait it out. You can just stay sweet. You can just live it out. Uh, Jesus, of all people, Hebrews 5, 8, learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Hebrews 12, 2, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Here's another one, John 16, 33. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So you never see that up on anybody's bathroom mirror or on the fridge or anything. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but. But see, we need to take this on board. Now, we, we live in a generation where, where our, we get our faith a lot of the times, and, and by that I mean the teaching that we're embracing as Christians, and we, we get it almost like little sound bites from here and there. Your favorite preacher said this, your favorite teacher said that, you were reading the red letters in the New Testament, and you got this. But I want to encourage you to read the whole counsel of God, the whole Bible, and make room for every word in here. I mean, that would be a different message, talking about the inspiration of the Word of God. But Jesus said this, It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one letter of the law to fail. I used to think that he was just being, you know, that was, that was a poetic way of saying, you know, the Bible's the word of God. But now I, I'm convinced that he meant every single letter is inspired and we, we to, we're to live by it uh, as preparation. And, and it's just so incredible. The, yeah, maybe one day I'll have to come back and we'll talk about the total, utter, absolute inspiration of the Word of God. Because the revival that we're in and that's about to break even more upon us is one of the Word and the Spirit. And so when you embrace it all, you know, you kind of are buffered against things like this from knocking you out of the game because people come to the conclusion that 
this is not working for me. It seems to be working for you. It seems to be working for you. But it's not working for me. Truth be told, I'm discouraged. I've prayed. I've given. I've tried to love. I've tried to this. I've tried to that. And the more I do, the more that seems to go wrong. And life is just unraveling for me. And, and see, we, we don't like to get honest enough to talk that way because we somehow think that others don't really want to hear it. Yeah? But, but family is a place where you can really get honest about what's going on. Now, here's what I think about that. Everybody gets a turn. If you haven't had your turn yet, don't worry. He won't forget about you. So that's comforting, isn't it? But be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. And I really, 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 really love that. Now, I can remember the long, dark night of the soul for me. Sort of early 30s, I'd just been to Israel. I I'd had an encounter with God, like waves of glory. The, the love of God overtook me. I didn't know if I was going to live through it or not. And I came home from that basically right into a nightmare where my first marriage just totally failed. And the harder I tried to fix it, the worse it got. And, and you know, the day came when it was absolutely over and there was nothing I could do about it. So I became Mr. Mom and had two girls, and, uh, and that was it. We moved, moved back to Toronto, our home, and, and just started in business and stuff like that. And uh, I was trusting the Lord as best as I could to, to fix it, but it did not get fixed. I was with R.T. Kendall recently. He made a comment I'd never heard before, but... I thought it was a worthy comment. He said, did you ever thank God for unanswered prayer? And I thought, wow. I begged him to fix that thing. And I can remember one night when I was just teetering on the edge. Like, God, I, I just can't do this anymore. And, and the enemy is telling me, look, why don't you just forget it? Why don't you just go out and, and just party on and wine women in song and just whatever. And I had a night of prayer where I settled it. And I said, Lord, if you don't fix this, then I want something better. So either you fix it or something better. And that gave me a little glimmer of hope because... He was going to do it one way or the other. And so we carried on. Well, I met Carol, and, you know, a number of years later, we were married, and, and her two sons and my two daughters, and we became the Brady Bunch, and, and we've lived happily ever after. It's, it's amazing. So there's the something better right there. But see, you have to overcome those kinds of things. That you have to know that the one with whom we have to do is committed to your well-being ultimately. And it's funny, but life is not really all about this life. It's preparation for that which is to come. Have you worked that out yet? You know, people sometimes say, well, how old are you now and everything else? Why, do, why are we curious about a person's age? See, we, we want to know how, how far along the journey are you? Are you halfway? I mean, if you're 35 or 40, you're probably halfway. How many are under 40? Let's see your hand. Wonderful. Good young church. How many are over 40? See, you're halfway. How many, how many are over 60? Okay, well, you're three quarters. And uh, how many are over 80? Okay, well, you, um, that's an achievement, by the way. It's hardly, hardly anybody makes that. But see, we, we pass on into something, and so we just need to bear that in mind 
as we go through life and this whole convoluted journey that we're in. But let's look at life for a minute. Historically, the planet has been a disaster, yeah? Wars after wars after wars, and this group beating up on that group and stealing their stuff and so on and so on. And then if we look at the biblical perspective, we see the same thing. Adam and Eve in the garden, what happens? Goes okay for a while, but then they're tempted and they sinned. They didn't pass the test. And so now we spiral downward. Well, God rescues them and t teaches them how to make clothes of skins. Do you know what that's all about? See, an animal has to die if you're going to wear leather, like the fig leaves just wouldn't do. Man's effort, fig leaves, no. The innocent must die for the guilty so the guilty can go free. And that dying animal to make leather clothes for Adam and Eve is symbolic to the Savior who one day will come and trade his life. And so... Uh, a lot of people don't really understand salvation, that it, it is the greatest legal transaction that ever happened, where the Son of God came and paid your debt in full with his own life. So who is great enough and significant enough to pay off the entire sin debt of the whole world? But that needs to be God himself, God the Son. That's why Jesus is not just a prophet, not just an archangel, not just a good man, not just a teacher, whatever. No, no, he is God the Son, born of the Virgin, who came and died for you and for me. And if you believe it, he paid your debt. So he will pay it off by the very fact that you say, Lord, will you have mercy and come and forgive me? And so that's what happened with Adam and Eve, first of all, the animal sacrifice, the lamb, whatever it was, is pointing to the Savior who will come one day. They pointed towards him. We're pointing back to him. But it's, it's the same thing. So all through the biblical uh, record, we see people falling into sin and getting deeper and deeper into trouble. Adam and Eve, okay, clothes of skins. Next thing you know, the human race is so far down that judgment must happen. The Lord says, we can't, we can't handle this anymore. We're going to have to send a flood that will put a stop to it all. And uh, then Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord and it all starts over again. We do pretty good for a while, but then... It goes downhill again, and the Lord finds Abraham um, and begins again with him. You know, I had a talk with some of our young leaders um, a while back, and, and one of the things they face among their friends is, is what's, what's called the, the injustices of, of Christianity. What kind of a God would wipe out the whole earth with a flood? What kind of a God would wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah, men, women, and children? And so they wanted to talk about that. So I said, okay, let's talk about Sodom. Um, the Lord came down, stopped by Abraham, and he said, you know, a cry has come up before me so I've come down to see if it's as bad as what I've heard or not. And Abraham says, uh oh, Sodom's going to get it. Lord, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare the city? Yeah. How about 45? Yeah. How about 40? Okay. How about 30? Okay. How about 20? Yeah. Or 20, we'll spare this. Does this sound like this angry, contentious, miserable? No, no, no. He says, Lord, don't be angry with me, but, but let me ask one more time. If there's but 10 righteous, it, will you, would you spare this city? And what did he say? If I find 10 righteous, I will spare the city. Abraham didn't 
ask any more uh, because he figured Lot probably had more than 10. I don't know. But anyway, God moved on. And you know what they found there? There was only four righteous that they could find in the entire city. Now, you need to know something about God is that he will not be mocked. Sin will be dealt with. Why? Because his kingdom is a kingdom of love, which means he's not going to allow people to carry on hurting one another in the name of selfishness and self-centeredness. So he will deal with it. But he's provided two ways to deal with it. One is judgment. The other is mercy at the cross. You can let Jesus pay your debt for you, and you come out from under the responsibility of paying your own debt. How many want to let Jesus pay your debt for you? Wouldn't that be great? Anyway, it's the God of love that's dealing because, so I asked these young people, okay, who was crying out to him? And we worked out that it was probably the women and the children in the city that were crying out for all the sinful, horrific things that were going on. I mean, you guys are big here on uh, fighting the, the, the sex trade and all that goes on. We just heard from Wes Campbell and some others in Pasadena, where we came from, about uh, the city in the Philippines where after the disaster, there were children rounded up and put in cages to be sold into the sex trade. And they were three and four and seven and eight and nine years old. And God looks at that, see, he, he loves justice and he hates injustice. So that's what's going on. He is forever calling us back into the place of love and peace. <sighs> So, Sodom was dealt with. By the way, Jesus said to Capernaum, if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have repented and remained to this day. Wow. Aren't we blessed that we see miracles among us? But there's this convoluted journey of life where we do okay for a while and then we fall away as as, as an individual and as a, and as a person. And uh, we, can, we could just go through the list. There's Noah, there's Abraham, there's Joseph, there's David, there's Jesus, there's all the apostles, and problem after problem. And even if we talk about your church, you've probably been through some struggles here. If we talk about your family, you've probably been through some struggles so why is life so convoluted? And I think the answer is God is building people, not just institutions. <clears throat> so like it or not, you and I are being tested. And the Lord's allowing it. And he's using it to test your heart. Now, when we read the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, the, the familiar part, there is saying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And uh, the Greek word there is perazzo, and it really means testing, because uh, tempting and testing originally was, was, was the same word. But in our case now, the, the word tempting has, has narrowed to mean tempting to wrong things, tempting you to partake in sin or wrong things. But really, we're better off with just the word uh, being translated as testing. Because God is not tempting anybody to sin, is he? How many think no? How many don't know what to think? <laughs> no, the answer is no. He's not tempting you to sin, but he is testing you so you can pray, Lord, Lead me not into testing, but deliver me from the evil one. <sighs> Turn to your friend and say, you're awfully quiet. <laughs> First Peter 1.7, the trial of your faith, 
being more precious than gold that perishes. There's something wonderful about a person who's been around the block a few times and came out golden, isn't there? You see, it's all how you come out of it that really is the issue. With what I went through, I could have become a very bitter, cynical person. And I'm sure I was for a while. But the Lord just so filled me with his love in that one encounter that I couldn't stay there. And I chose to trust him for a better day and better things. And I tell you, when Carol and I got married, there was just this favor that came on us just almost right away. We went to, you know, because I had thought, well, that's it for my dream of ever being in the ministry. I mean, who wants a divorced pastor? Well, I had a dear friend, pastor, mentor, Alec Ness, who said to me, John, whatever happened to your love for souls? I said, wow, I still have that. He said, then you need to go for it. I said, how can I? I mean, I'm disqualified. He said, listen, half this country is divorced. Go minister to that half. <laughs> oh. I thought, all right, we'll do it. And I realize it's not the unpardonable sin, so let's just get on with it. And you know what? That, that it put an edge on me that was much more tolerant, much more, you know, the self-righteousness kind of went away. Because I, I used to have this, this emphasis that it's all about truth. It's all about right doctrine. You've got to get your doctrine straight. You've got to have your life in order and, and, and it was kind of legalistic. And, but you know what? When you've done your best and life fails all around you, it can kind of round you out a little bit, make you a better person. And uh, I think I became more loving than ever at that point. And God put Carol in my life, and we were in the same boat. Her husband left her. She, she'd been on her own for seven years. And uh, he, he married a, a girl she knew for years, but uh, they worked in the same place. So he, he, can you imagine he left Carol for somebody who's like... <laughs> and so... I ended up with Carol, can you imagine? <clears throat> and just like that, we went to Indonesia. We, we thought we were going on a mission trip, to, we did, but they thought we were these evangelists from Canada, and oh my gosh, we were into three-day crusades and everything else, and it was just so, so far over our head. But anyway, we came back ruined by the love of those people, and we said, God, we can't give our lives to business. What can we do? And he said, I want you to go to Carol's hometown and plant a church. Because I told him we'd go anywhere, do anything. Don't let him hear you say that, by the way. <laughs> so we went back and we were, the, it, uh, we lived it down and practiced on those poor people. And, uh, and we have a wonderful church there to this day, our first church in Stratford, Ontario, her hometown. But then we moved back to Toronto and, and started out there. And then about six or seven years after we started, kaboom, the Holy Spirit fell. And wow, yeah. we went for the ride of our lives. So you see, you have to trust him through the dark times. And you need a theology for adversity because... Uh, your testing is precious in the sight of the Lord, much like gold. Do you know how to refine gold? Fire seven times. Because see, first you, you heat it up to 1,000 degrees C and it becomes liquid. And all the impurities will uh, come to the top and you skim them off. Then you let it cool. Then you heat it up again to 1,000 degrees. And wouldn't you know, more impurities. 
of not as many, but still a lot. And you do that seven times, and then you get what they call 99.99% pure. How many would like to be that pure? Anybody? Okay, now how do you get there? <laughs> it's not the fire of the Holy Spirit with joy and love and you know, happiness and everything. It's these fiery trials that come upon us. And you pass the test by saying, I don't care if I die, I'll, I, I'm going to be true to him no matter what. Because that popular theology says, if I have enough faith, if I know the word enough, if I'm full of prayer enough, if I'm full of worship enough, if I'm full of the spirit enough, if I put it all together just right, I won't have any problems. Now, I would say if you do it all right, you can minimize the problems, but you're not going to eliminate the problems. Why? Because he wants to test you. Tell your friend, the Lord wants to test you. You may be noticed, have you been tested already? Now, let me just say, do not have faith for the counterattack. This is a little aside here. Um, if you have faith for the counterattack, well, guess what? It'll come. If you have, you know, according to your faith, be it unto you. So, uh, a lot of Christians think that if you start out to do something and you hit all kinds of adversity, that's proof that you must be in the will of God because the devil is really reacting to it. Now, I want you to just be clear. The devil hates you. <laughs> he hates everything that you're about as a Christian, and he would like to kill you. How many know that? All right, how come you're still alive? Because God's in the equation, yeah? And so we're not going to sign up for that counterattack things. And, you know, this is a bit of an aside, but I think it's important as we're trying to work out, well, how do we know it's not the enemy? And how, you know, we just have to trust him. Yes. We were at a round table years ago with leaders, revival leaders from around North America, I think. And one after another, they were telling the stories about, wow, our church got struck by lightning and this and that happened, so the devil's really mad at us and so we and, and they used the, the adversity to prove that they must be in the will of God. Now, can you imagine, you measure the degree that you're in the will of God by the amount of adversity that you're facing. I'm like, no way. And they came around to our turn and they're like, wow, you guys must be really going through it with all that you're stirring up. And we looked at each other and went, actually, no, we're not. Like, we've never had so much fun. We've never, <laughs> we've never, <laughs> it's, it's just amazing what, what, you know, well, we lost our luggage one time. And do you know, after I said that, we started losing our luggage. And I'm like, okay, we are not losing. Our, I started to pray, thank you, Lord, that our luggage arrives safe and, and everything else. And, and it just really, really helped. And then we worked out, if you happen to lose your luggage, you want to lose it for like 24 hours because then you get about $500 to go shopping and buy new <laughs> So, you know, all things work together, don't they? <laughs> but <clears throat> don't have faith for the counterattack, okay? Don't help the devil by believing in him. But you want to be an overcomer. Now, you guys like to be out of here by 12, so I need to hurry. <sighs> Who's your favorite Bible character? David. David. Joseph. Joseph. Jesus, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. Esther, Esther. Abraham. Abraham, I want you to pick one who had no trouble. Are you kidding me? 
<laughs> they crucified him. Pick one who had no trouble, come on. One of our young people said to me, I know one, was Enoch. <laughs> Enoch walked with God, God took him. That's about all it says. I said, wait a minute. He, he lived in the pre-flood world where it was so evil that the Lord was sorry that he'd even created man on the earth. Does that sound like a walk in the park to you? There's something about human nature that needs to be tested. Carol loves to preach on Joseph and uh, Joseph's whole story. I mean, you can imagine the testing this guy went through. He's his father's favorite son, which is wrong in one sense. <laughs> but he's a type of Jesus, so we can understand that Jesus is the favorite son of our Heavenly Father. Are you okay with that? You're a son and a daughter, but he has a favorite. His name is Jesus, all right? Joseph's a type of that. But the other brothers were so jealous of it, they, they, his dreams, and he said, hey, I had a dream. You, um, your sheaves all bowing down to my sheaf. And they, you know, no, no. They, be, they grew to hate him, and they wanted to kill him, but settled for selling him. And there he is in Egypt, and then falsely accused. He's in prison for 13 years at least. What would you be saying? God, where the heck are you? What happened to all this? You're going to be a ruler one day. What's going on, God? See, he's being prepared to be a leader. So it's unto something. If you can stay sweet and hang on to your anointing uh, while you're unjustly in prison for 13 or 14 years, you just may have some potential in the kingdom of God. Because overnight, boom, he's uh, prime minister. How many want to be like Joseph? Hands up high. Okay, how do you get like Joseph? Joseph. Yeah, you go through the, the refiner's fire like he did. Somebody said, David over here. You want to be like David? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It started out okay. He was minding the sheep, minding his own business. Samuel came around and says, it's none of these guys. Have we got any more sons? Well, there's, there's the boy out there minding the sheep. Bring him. He anoints him in front of all his brothers. He kills Goliath. He marries Saul's daughter. He's promoted in the army, looks pretty good until the king gets jealous of him and starts hunting him down. You know, people get jealous of your anointing. If you're anointed, don't do that. Rejoice in the differences and the giftings of other people. We're not all supposed to be the same. But Saul went sour, and so David was the replacement. But even there, David, th things went downhill with him to where he eventually went over to the Philistines. And they didn't trust him either. They sent him out to Ziklag on the fringes of their kingdom. And then wanting to go to battle one day, they sent him back home only to find that the Amalekites had come in. They'd burned Ziklag and... The women are gone, the children are gone, the stuff is gone, and his own men want to stone him. Now what do you say in those times? God, I can't make this work for me. You know, this is too convoluted, too random for me. I don't know what the heck is going on. I quit. I don't want to serve you. I mean, you know, there are multitudes of people who are punishing God by backsliding. That's like cutting your legs off because you don't like what's happening around you. The last thing you want to do is distance yourself from God. Right? 
David strengthened himself in the Lord that day. And the Lord said, go after them and you will recover everything. So they did. You know, they got their wives back, their kids back, their stuff back. It's like a country and western song. <laughs> got my truck back, you know. Why? Because he's God, the great restorer. But the deal is you have to keep your heart sweet. You know, one of my heroes as a young Christian was Catherine Kuhlman. How many have heard of her? How many of you were ever in one of her meetings? One, two, three, four, and a half. Let's hear it for old people. <laughs> Catherine Coleman died about almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago or something. But anyway, she used to, <clears throat> when I was in Bible school and working night shift and stuff, I would always tape her radio program. And, you know, it started out the same way. And I'm like, oh, get on with it, Catherine. Because I wanted her to get to the good stuff, you know. But she would be so theatrical. Well, hello there. And have you been waiting for me? Oh, that's so nice of you. And remember, as long as God is still on his throne and here's an answer's prayer. And just so long as your faith in him is still intact, everything will come out all right. <laughs> you know, she went through that every radio program, every 15-minute program. And, but, but it so stuck with me because, see, just so long as your faith in him is still intact, and that's the warfare right there. The enemy wants to convince you that God no longer cares about you. He never did like you in the first place. He doesn't like your ethnic group anyway. And he doesn't like this. And he doesn't like that. Why don't you just quit and give up on this God stuff? And it will undermine your faith in him. But listen, she, her, she, her words were so right. As So long as your faith in him is still intact... And you hang in there, no matter what it looks like, everything will come out all right. Turn to your friend and say, you're going to be okay. Now we could go through all the Bible characters. We could go through Paul in the New Testament. I don't know if anybody said Paul or not. God told him on the front end, I'm going to show you what great things you, you will be suffering for my name's sake. My goodness. And by the way, when you're led by the Holy Spirit, that doesn't guarantee immunity from problems. You know, Paul's trying to go into Asia, he's trying to go here, he's trying to go there, and nothing's opening up. Finally, he has a dream. A man in Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. That's it, he said. Him and Silas got on the next boat in the morning. Away they go to uh, Philippi in, in uh, Macedonia. And it went okay for a while. They found Lydia, and there's a prayer meeting. They joined in. Then he cast a demon out of this little fortune-telling girl, and everything went south. He's arrested, taken, and beaten. And they threw them in the inner prison and put their feet in the stocks. Now, what would you be saying? If I was there... If I was Silas, I'd look, lean over to him and say, you and your dreams. You were so sure this was God. Here we are. My hands are locked down, my feet are locked down, and I have to go to the bathroom. And <laughs> my back is beaten raw. But that's not what they're doing. They're worshiping. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Da, 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 da. The other prisoners saying, shut up in there. <laughs> freedom. Next thing you know, an earthquake. All the chains fall off. 
And the jailer is like, what's going on? What happened? Where's my sword? I'm going to kill myself. All the doors are open. Paul says, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. The guy came in with a light, falls at his feet and said, what must I do to be saved? Him and his whole household saved that day. You see, the leading of the Holy Spirit does not guarantee you immunity from problems. Know that. You just need to settle it in your heart that you're going to be an overcomer. Now, how many want to be an overcomer? Okay, now listen carefully. Overcomers need some things to overcome. 